Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and I'm here with my son Henry, of course. Hi! And today is our final installment of this four-part series entitled Abraham Lincoln, our 16th President of the United States. And today in part four, we're going to take a look at the gravesite of Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln's tomb in Springfield, Illinois. And of course, that's what we do here at Dead History, right? We look at grave sites. That's where we go. Yep. But some really cool things. It's not just about the tomb that you're going to see today. You're going to hear about the train caravan that carried Lincoln's body, the procession, the train procession, what? across the country after he was assassinated, oh. yep, to get to Springfield, Illinois. Then you're going to hear about the tomb where he was held until his actual tomb that you're going to see was finished and completed. You're going to hear about the fact that there was grave robbers who tried to steal Abraham Lincoln's body years ago. All this fascinating stuff. So, what do they got to do first, Henry? Hit subscribe down below, leave all your comments and questions, give a little like, and hit that little notification button. I mean, the best. I don't have to say anything else. Do it all. Do what the kid said. Good job. And, of course, we're going to get into some really cool things today. Some sad, somber things. But I got a really special, special, special treat that I get to share with you. It's a personal thing. And we're going to get into all that. So now, sit back and relax. Part four, our final part of this four-part series looking at Abraham Lincoln. And this is... Dead History. Dead History. Hey guys, TJ back with you. Henry here with me. Hi. And here we go, part four. Our last part of this four-part series. Mm -hmm. And I get to show you guys a really special special thing that I got a very special treat because when I visited Lincoln's tomb last year during the pandemic of 2020 I got to visit Abraham Lincoln's tomb all by myself what? there was nobody inside the tomb with me there was nobody around it was just me and one of the staff workers who worked there and I'm gonna get into that story and show you very unique very special thing to be inside of Lincoln's tomb all by yourself so I'm gonna show and share that with you and at the end of this video, stay tuned, you're going to see a little in memoriam page. Because back on President's Day this year, it's very fitting that we're talking about Abraham Lincoln. Two presidents we celebrate on President's Day, Abraham Lincoln and George Washington. And this year on President's Day, my dad, whose name is Thomas Fallon, he passed away on President's Day, Henry's grandfather, right? Mm -hmm. And we're going to show you a little special in memoriam page to my father at the end of this video. So just stay tuned after the video ends. And again, what we want you to do is sit back and relax, enjoy, as Henry said last time, get out those chips, get out those snacks, and watch as we take a look at the tomb of Abraham Lincoln, his gravesite of our 16th president of the United States. Enjoy. Hey guys, welcome back. It is our conclusion of this four-part series, taking a look at the life, legacy, and death of our 16th president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. This is TJ with Dead History, and I have a special guest back with me for the last part of this audio. Henry's with me. Hi. <laughs> He's back. Uh, and it's kind of fitting that we're doing the audio of uh, Lincoln's funeral and uh, his final resting place today, uh, because today, uh, this morning, we actually... Um, had the funeral for my father, Henry's grandfather, uh, Thomas Fallon. And at the end of this video, uh, there will be a little in memoriam tribute to my dad. So, uh, you know, if you want to catch that uh, at the end. Um, so it's kind of fitting that we're doing the funeral uh, part four audio today. So we're going to jump right in here. And as I just said, part four, this is all about the funeral and, of course, Lincoln's final resting place, the Lincoln Tomb in Springfield, Illinois. Uh, what we're going to do, just so everybody knows, as you're seeing pictures and those things on the screen, as I, I'm going to be starting to talk here, I'm going through the entire funeral train procession from the time it started all the way to its, obviously, arrival in Springfield, Illinois. So the pictures you're going to be seeing, they're going to be... You know, at different locations, you know, you're going to see old pictures from when the train stopped in this city and that city and that sort of thing. So that's the way this is going to follow along. 
it's just going to be kind of pictures and drawings and stuff uh, from that day, those days, I should say. Um, and we're just going to keep going through it that, that way. And then, you know, toward the end, I'll show you my pictures of the tomb, kind of tell you my story about the tomb when I visited, uh, all that good stuff. So let's jump right in here. After the April 14th, 1865 assassination of Abraham Lincoln, our 16th president of the United States, a three-week series of events mourned his death and memorialized his life. Funeral services and lines in state were held in Washington, D.C., and then additional cities and state capitals as a funeral train transported his remains for burial in his hometown of Springfield, Illinois. Again, not where he was born, not where he grew up, but he did live there during his political career and uh, a lot of his life, uh, the majority of his life, he, he did live in Illinois. But um, so, yeah, so that's where he was living uh, when he was president. He had a home there in Springfield. Uh, Abraham Lincoln's eldest son, Robert Todd Lincoln, rode the train to Baltimore and then he disembarked and returned to the White House. Lincoln's wife, Mary Todd Lincoln, she remained at the White House because she was too distraught to make the trip. Robert Todd Lincoln took a later train to Springfield for his finals, father's final funeral and burial. Um, the remains, actually, of uh, Lincoln's younger son, Willie Lincoln, they were also placed on the train, which left Washington, D.C. Uh, on April 21st at 1230 and traveled a total of 1,654 miles, never exceeding 20 miles an hour, to the final stop at Springfield, where they arrived in Springfield on May 3rd. Several stops in principal cities and state capitals were made along the way in which ceremonies and processions were held. The train largely retraced the route that Lincoln had traveled to Washington as the president-elect on his way to his first inauguration, actually, more than four years earlier. Millions of Americans viewed the train along the route and participated, participated in the ceremonies and the processions. Uh, Willie Lincoln, just a little side note, he was actually interred on May 4th, uh, 1865 when he died at Oak Ridge. Um, no, that's wrong. He was inter Lincoln was interred. I'm, I'm reading something wrong here. President Lincoln was interred on May 4th of 1865 at the Oak Ridge Cemetery in Springfield. That's the site of the Lincoln tomb. It's, it's owned and managed now by a state historic site. Um, we're going to get into all of that. Mary Todd Lincoln and three of her four sons, Willie, Eddie, and Tad, they're also buried there with Lincoln at Lincoln's tomb in Springfield, Illinois. Robert Todd Lincoln's the only one who's not buried there. He's actually buried, Robert Todd Lincoln's actually buried in Arlington National Cemetery in uh, Virginia. So, um, just to give you a little uh, thing about Willie Lincoln, uh, did I actually write that in? Let me just see if I did. Uh, I thought I did. Do, 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 do. Yes, I did. I did. So I'll get to that in a second. Uh, after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln by John Wilkes Booth, Lincoln's body was carried by an honor guard to the White House. That was on Saturday, April 15th of 1865. There, Lincoln laid in state in the East Room of the White House, which was open to the public on Tuesday, April 18th. And then on April 19th, a funeral service was held, and then the coffin, attended by large crowds, was transported in a procession down Pennsylvania a Avenue to the Capitol Rotunda, where a ceremonial burial service was held. The body again lay in state on the 20th, and on the early morning of the following day, a prayer service was held uh, for the Lincoln cabinet officials. So, here we go. I'm going to get really into depth with, uh, with everything that took place. Uh, right, Henry? We're going to go to, like, every city yeah. and... Yeah, every city, every... You tell, yeah, everywhere yeah, they went. Yeah, yeah everywhere. Okay, here we go. Here we go. On April 18th of 1865, the viewing at the White House started at 10 a.m., but crowds started to gather by 8.30 that morning. By the time the doors opened, the line was five people wide and stretched for a half mile. The throng entered the White House at the main entrance and walked to the East Room, where they shuffled past Lincoln's body in a solid walnut coffin lined with lead and adorned with silver handles. The casket, which had been purchased from Harvey and Sands Undertakers for $1,500, was small and narrow by today's standards. 
six and a half feet long and only 18 inches at shoulder, barely larger than the president's frame. On the casket was a silver plate that actually read, Abraham Lincoln, 16th President of the United States, born February 12th, 1809, died April 15th of 1865. That day, 25,000 people saw Lincoln's sweet, placid, natural expression, and the discoloration caused by the wound was so slight as not to amount to a disfigurement. For Lincoln, this is really eerie and weird. Um, I'll get into this in one second here. I got a very strange, eerie thing to tell you about. So here is the eerie thing that I'm going to tell you about. For Lincoln, this scene in the East Room would have been eerily familiar as he had envisioned it in a dream. In his dream, he wandered through an empty White House, working his way to the East Room, where a crowd was gathered around a coffin. Lincoln asked the soldier whose body was in the coffin and was giving a haunting reply. It was the president who had been killed by an assassin. Abraham Lincoln was so troubled by this dream that he later told his wife and a few friends. And several times Abraham Lincoln told friends that he would not survive to see the end of the Civil War. That is eerie and weird. So the next day, on April 19th of 1865, after a two-hour funeral at the White House, Lincoln's coffin was carried to a 15-foot-tall black hearse placed on a bed of evergreens and covered with white flowers. Six white horses slowly pulled the glass-sided hearse to the Capitol. Lincoln's body would then lay in rest at the Capitol to be viewed by waiting crowds until April 21st. Then, on April 21st, Six days after Abraham Lincoln's death, the Washington, D.C. viewing finally came to a close. Lincoln's body left the Capitol that morning in procession, and at 7.30 a.m., his coffin was placed on board the train, and then the train left precisely at 8 a.m. The train pulled away from the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Depot in Washington, D.C., bound for Baltimore, Maryland, 38 miles away. This would be the last time that President Abraham Lincoln would ever be in our nation's capital. The funeral train had nine cars. It included a baggage car, a hearse car, and the president's car. Built for use by the president and other officials and containing a parlor, sitting room, and sleeping apartment. The president's car was draped in mourning and carried the coffins of Lincoln and his son Willie. New locomotives were substituted at several points. Willie Lincoln's body was exhumed from his original burial and gravesite at Oak Hill Cemetery in Washington, D.C., and it was placed on board the funeral train alongside his father's body to then be reinterred next to his father's final resting place in Springfield, Illinois. So Willie Lincoln, when he first died, he was there in Washington, D.C. buried, and obviously it was exhumed, and it was placed on the train with his dad to take this long ride out to Springfield where they would both finally rest in peace at their final resting spots. The train's route was planned from Washington, D.C. to Springfield, Illinois, and it would take place on April 21st of 1865 through until May 4th of 1865. The train carrying Lincoln's body traveled through 180 cities and seven states on its way to Lincoln's home state of Illinois. So he scheduled stops. As I said, the train carrying Lincoln's body traveled through 180 cities and seven states on its way to Lincoln's home state of Illinois. Scheduled stops for the special funeral train were published in newspapers. Lincoln's three-week-long funeral procession was the first time a president's death was commemorated by train travel. The procession passed through 444 communities plus Washington, D.C. Pretty cool. Pretty cool stuff. At each stop, 
Lincoln's coffin was taken off the train, placed on an elaborately decorated horse-drawn hearse, and led by solemn processions to a public building for viewing. In cities as large as Columbus, Ohio, and as small as Herkimer, New York, thousands of mourners flocked to pay tribute to the slain president. In Philadelphia, Lincoln's body lay in state in the east wing of Independence Hall, the same site where the Declaration of Independence was signed. We've been there before, right, Henry? We've been. Yep, Independence Hall in Philadelphia. We've been there. Yep, where Declaration of Independence was signed. Newspapers reported that people had to wait more than five hours to pass by the president's coffin in some cities. Lincoln's remains were re-embalmed at every city stop. Following his assassination, Lincoln's casket remained unsealed for the next 19 days, requiring constant embalming to accommodate the series of public viewings. Embalming had risen in use during the Civil War as deceased soldiers were prepared for shipment to distant relatives. The task of embalming Lincoln's remains fell to Dr. Charles Brown, Three years before, he was the same doctor who had embalmed the remains of Lincoln's young son, Willie Lincoln. Dr. Charles Brown. He was in charge of it all. Lincoln's funeral train was dubbed the Lincoln Special. His portrait was fastened to the front of the engine above the cattle guard, and approximately 300 people accompanied Lincoln's body on the 1,654-mile journey. Lincoln's funeral route retraced his original journey as president-elect in 1861, as I said a little bit a little bit ago. Roughly a third of the entire U.S. population, out of a total of 31 million, participated in some kind of memorial commemoration for Lincoln. Lincoln's funeral train was the first national commemoration of a president's death by rail. Lincoln was observed, mourned, and honored by the citizens and visitors of Washington, Maryland, Pennsylvania, New York, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. Wow. Yep. All in the following cities. Here we go. Here's the route. This is what it did. The train departed Washington, D.C. on April 21st of 1865. It was heading to Baltimore, Maryland. It arrived in Baltimore, Maryland at around 10 a.m. Lincoln's body was then laid in state and a funeral was held at the Merchants Exchange Building for a two-hour period. Then, shortly after 3 p.m. on April 21st, the train began the 58-mile trip to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. At 6.53 p.m., the train stopped briefly at York Station in Pennsylvania. The train arrived at the Pennsylvania Railroad Station in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania at 8.20 p.m. on April 21st. The body of President Abraham Lincoln laid in state at the Pennsylvania State Capitol Building until midnight on that long day. Then, it was open for viewing at 7 a.m. the next morning, which was now April 22nd of 1865. Lincoln's body was placed back onto the train at 11.15 a.m., and it pulled out of the station for the 106-mile trip to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. At 4.50 p.m., cannon fired announced the arrival of the train at Broad and Prime Street, and the coffin was gingerly placed in a magnificent custom-built hearse. It was drawn by eight black horses. The hearse then left the station at 5.15 p.m. It was a long march that lasted nearly three hours. Yeah. The procession in Philly lasted almost three hours of a procession march. It finally arrived a few minutes before 8 p.m. on April 22nd at Independence Square. A private viewing was then held at Independence Hall, the birthplace of the country's Declaration of Independence. And again, in the wee hours of the morning on April 23rd of 1865. Finally then, at 6 a.m. on April 23rd, the doors opened for the longest period of viewing thus far. And then to conclude, finally at 2 a.m. 
on the next day, April 24th of 1865, after a mind-boggling 300,000 people had viewed the casket in only 20 hours' time, the doors were closed. And shortly before 4 a.m., the train slowly began its journey north for the 86-mile trip to New York. Now, we are going to get into something near and dear to my heart and Henry's heart, because we're going to be talking about the train passing through our home state of... New Jersey. New Jersey. Here we go. At 5.30 a.m. on April 24th of 1865, the funeral train crossed the Delaware River into New Jersey, and it stopped briefly to pick up Governor Joel Parker and his staff to officially escort the body through our home state. The bells tolled as the train chugged into Trenton, New Jersey, where it stopped at 5.45 a.m. The train then pushed north through Princeton, New Jersey, and stopped again briefly in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Then it rolled on through Rawway and Elizabeth, New Jersey. It continued to the Broad Street Station in Newark, New Jersey, and at 10.03 a.m., it came to a halt in the Camden and Amboy Railway Depot in my father's hometown of Jersey City, New Jersey. It was here that Lincoln's body was removed from the train for its first boat ride on the ferry, Jersey City. The boat now crossed the Hudson River, and Lincoln's body was never viewed in my home state of New Jersey. Yep, it passed through. It stopped at a few train stations along the way and finally ended and stopped and came to a halt in my father's hometown of Jersey City, New Jersey. Again, very fitting that we're recording this on the day of my father's funeral. And it was never viewed, though. There was no public viewing in New Jersey. It just made some stops along the way. And then now, finally at 10.50 a.m. on April 24th of 1865, the ferry boat arrived at Desbroser Street in Manhattan. The coffin then arrived at New York City Hall at 11.30 a.m. And at 1 p.m., the doors were opened to a line of people that stretched three quarters of a mile. The long day finally came to a conclusion. The next morning, the viewing proceeded. Finally, the lid was closed and Lincoln's body at 12.50 p.m. on April 25th of 1865 was carried back to the hearse and the return procession would soon follow. Massive crowds gathered as the funeral marched the streets of New York City. The hearse eventually passed the home of Cornelius Roosevelt, President Teddy Roosevelt's grandfather. And in an eerily spectacular meeting of past and future presidential titans, the moment was captured in photograph. If you see here on your screen now, there are two little boys that can be seen in a second story window as Lincoln's hearse passed by the residence. Those two little boys were Elliot Roosevelt and his seven-year-old brother, Theodore Roosevelt. Yes, future president Teddy Roosevelt witnessed Abraham Lincoln's funeral procession going right by his grandfather's home. Concluding the New York City funeral at 2.10 p.m., the procession reached the Hudson River Railroad Depot. And shortly after 3 p.m., Lincoln's casket was placed aboard the train. Then approximately at 4.15 p.m., all aboard! The train began its 141-mile trip to Albany, New York. The train chugged north, and it stopped briefly at West Point at 6.20 p.m. Moving along, the train then briefly paused in Poughkeepsie, New York. Finally, almost seven hours after leaving New York City, the train pulled into East Albany at 11 p.m. on April 25th of 1865. After unloading the president, his casket was placed in the assembly chamber at Albany, New York's Old Capitol Building. 
At 1 a.m. on April 26th of 1865, crowds began to file in, and this continued over the next 13 hours. As the funeral viewings were taking place, 400 miles to the south on a farm in Port Royal, Virginia, Abraham Lincoln's assassin John Wilkes Booth was finally captured and killed. Yes. And at 2 p.m. on April 26th of 1865, the doors were closed again, the procession began toward the train station, and at 4 p.m., the train left the station for the now 298-mile trip up to Buffalo, New York. Now traveling north, but mainly from east to west, traversing the state of New York, at 11.15 p.m., there was a brief stop in Syracuse, New York. Another brief stop after that in Rochester, New York at 3.20 a.m., which was now April 27th of 1865. On April 27th of 1865, at 5.18 a.m., the Lincoln funeral train arrived in Batavia, New York, where former President Millard Fillmore boarded the train. Then at 7 a.m. on April 27th, The train pulled into Buffalo's Exchange Street Station in Buffalo, New York. The casket arrived at St. James Hall, and the viewing began at 9.35 a.m. The doors finally closed at 8.15 p.m., and Lincoln's remains were escorted to the station. At 10 p.m., the train departed for the 183-mile trip to Cleveland, Ohio. At 1 a.m., There was a brief stop in Westfield, New York. Then, the train crossed into Wycliffe, Ohio. On April 28, 1865, artillery shots announced the train's arrival. And at 7 a.m., the train pulled in to the Euclid Street Station in Cleveland, Ohio. The procession made its way to the public square in downtown Cleveland, where the city had built a new structure for the funeral. Throughout this day, there would actually be steady rain. And at 10.10 p.m., after approximately 150,000 people had walked past the coffin, the viewing in Cleveland came to an end. And at midnight, on what was now April 29th of 1865, the train left Cleveland for the 135-mile trip to Columbus, Ohio, through what was now torrential rains. At 7.30 a.m. on April 29th of 1865, the train pulled into Union Depot in Columbus, Ohio. At 9 a.m., the funeral procession arrived at the west entrance to the Capitol Square, and the coffin was placed in the rotunda of the State Capitol of Ohio building. At 6 p.m., the doors were closed, the coffin was returned to the train depot, And at 8 p.m., the train began the 187-mile trip for Indianapolis, Indiana. A stop in Woodstock, Ohio, then in Urbana, Urbana, Ohio, at around 10.45 p.m. The train stopped once again at 3.10 a.m. on April 30th of 1865 in Richmond, Ohio. But finally, on April 30th of 1865... The train, at around 7 a.m., pulled into the Union Depot in Indianapolis, Indiana. The coffin was placed on black velvet in the center of the Great Hall beneath the rotunda of the Indiana State House. And at 9 a.m., the doors were opened. And after a very long day of viewing and paying respects in a state that Lincoln once called home, at 10 p.m., the viewing came to an end. On May 1st of 1865, at midnight, the train left Indianapolis and headed the 210-mile journey to Chicago, Illinois. At 8.25 a.m. on May 1st, 1865, the train arrived in Michigan City, Indiana. This was only a 35-minute stop. Lincoln's funeral train was forced to wait here for a committee of more than 100 important men from Chicago who were coming out to escort the train into their city. Eventually, after the 35-minute brief stop, the train rolled on. 
the train made its final state border crossing into the state of Illinois, the land of Lincoln, at Lake Calumet at 11 a.m. on May 1st. The sun welcomed the train into Chicago, Illinois, a little after 11 a.m. that morning. The procession drew thousands as it marched through the streets of Chicago, finally making its way into the east gate of the courthouse square. It was now 12.45 p.m., and Lincoln's body had arrived at the old Chicago courthouse. At 5 p.m., mourners entered to pay their respects, and at around 9 p.m., it began to rain again, but this did not slow down the crowds. People continued to stream in throughout the night and into the next day. It was now May 2nd of 1865. And at 8 p.m. on May 2nd, the 27-hour marathon viewing had came to a close. It was now time for Lincoln's body to be returned to the train. At 9.30 p.m. on May 2nd of 1865, the train departed for its final 104 miles to the place where the 16th President of the United States would be laid to rest for all eternity, Springfield, Illinois. At 11.33 p.m., the train passed a one-minute gun salute in Lockport, Illinois. It was now Tuesday, May 3rd of 1865, and after almost non-stop rain and cloudy weather, it was suddenly sunny in Springfield when the Lincoln funeral train made its final stop at around 9 a.m. on May 3rd of 1865. The procession made its way through the streets, finally arriving at the Springfield State House, which is today known as the Old Capitol. The coffin was then placed in the House of Representatives Hall, in the middle of the room beneath the dome. The doors were opened to the public at 10 a.m., the crowds rushed in, and over the next 24 hours, 75,000 people viewed the remains of Abraham Lincoln. That was more than six times the population of Springfield, Illinois at the time. Pretty impressive, yeah. right? Yeah. It's pretty impressive, right, Henry? After the viewing ended on May 4th of 1865, the coffin was closed for the final time, and the lid was soldered shut. After 19 days, President Abraham Lincoln's body would finally be entombed. May 4th, 1865, at 11.30 a.m., the funeral procession began as the band struck up Lincoln's Funeral March. The procession passed by his former home on 8th and Jackson Street, still owned by the Lincoln family, and then at 1 p.m. on May 4th of 1865, the funeral arrived at Oak Ridge Cemetery in Springfield, Illinois. While the original lot was chosen in Springfield, Mary Lincoln insisted that she recalled Lincoln saying he wanted to be buried at Oak Ridge Cemetery, a more rural location, and so the site was moved. Little backstory to that. Shortly after Lincoln's death, a delegation of Illinois citizens, later forming the National Lincoln Monument Association, asked Mrs. Lincoln to return her husband's remain to Springfield for burial. She agreed, and the group then researched various sites in and around Springfield, selecting a centrally located hilltop site known as Mather Block and a temporary receiving vault was actually built there. However, Mrs. Lincoln selected Oak Ridge Cemetery for her husband's burial, despite repeated attempts by the association to change the location of the burial to Mather Block. Mrs. Lincoln remained firm in her decision. Mary Lincoln recalled that Abraham Lincoln once had said that he wanted a quiet place for his burial at Oak Ridge. He apparently said this to her on May 24th of 1860 when Abraham Lincoln was then running for president and Mary Lincoln was attending the dedication of Oak Ridge, a rural quiet cemetery two miles from the heart of Springfield. On April 28th, Mary Lincoln sent a message to Secretary of War Edwin N. Stanton in which she stated that her decision was final and that Lincoln's remains must be placed in the Oak Ridge Cemetery. On April 29th, another message followed. 
Arrangements for using the Mather Vault must be changed. And on May 1st, the message was, the remains of the president should be placed in the vault of Oak Ridge and nowhere else. The Oak Ridge Vault was readied, but work on the Mather Vault continued as a contingency. And even after the burial, the debate was not over. The National Lincoln Monument Association, be Association began again to stoke the fires of creating the grand tomb for Lincoln at the Mather Block. Mary Lincoln threatened to have her husband's remain taken to Chicago or Washington for permanent burial. My determination is unalterable, she wrote on June 10th, and demanded a formal promise that the immortal savior and martyr for freedom would be at Oak Ridge and imposed a deadline of June 15th before she would make good on her threat. The association voted, and on the evening before the deadline, by the narrowest of margins, actually 8-7 to seven vote, to accept her demands. And Oak Ridge Cemetery became the site of what we now know as the Lincoln Tomb. Some side note things here, but interesting things. Abraham Lincoln's funeral nationwide was segregated. There were a few exceptions, but not without struggle. More than 5,000 African Americans had planned to march in New York City, along with 120,000 other marchers. But city leaders promptly issued a ban. A telegram from Edwin Stanton, the Secretary of War, overruled the ban. And in the end, just a few hundred African Americans managed to join the tail end of the procession. Yet, triumphantly, as the New York Times reported, their presence was the only portion of the procession which was received with any demonstration of applause. In the end, two African-American ministers led Lincoln's cordage to the burial site. Lincoln's remains arrived in Springfield on that morning of May 3rd of 1865, and in a break from the segregated tone of the funeral procession elsewhere nationwide, Reverend Henry Brown, who had worked for the Lincolns as a handyman, and another local minister, Reverend William C. Treven, Trevin, led Lincoln's favored horse, Old Bob, down the final stretch of the route to the Oak Ridge Cemetery, where Lincoln was finally led, laid to rest on May 4th of 1865. Abraham Lincoln's barber declined to join the funeral procession at the front. William D. Florville, also known as Florville, a Haitian American who had settled in Springfield, Illinois, and served as Lincoln's barber for 24 years, he was invited to join Springfield's dignitaries at the front of the funeral procession. But Florville, he chose instead to march at the back, where Springfield's African-American delegation was relegated. Pretty crazy, right? Here's the man that did the Emancipation Proclamation, a man who had a major role in ending slavery and putting an end to the mortal sin, as he once called it, that was slavery. And during his funeral, it was still segregated throughout the nation. That's that's unbelievable, right, Henry? Unbelievable. The veteran reserve guard stood by the hearse as Robert and Tad Lincoln and other family members and friends removed the coffin and carried it inside the stone walls of a temporary public vault that had been covered in black velvet. Willie Lincoln was then placed in, inside. The funeral ceremony then began. After some prayers and sermons, the heavy iron doors of the tomb were closed, and at long last, the ceremony had ended. The key to the padlock was handed to Robert Lincoln, who passed it along to his mother's cousin, John Todd Stewart. Thus has the nation buried Abraham Lincoln with a burial more illustrious than that of kings. The vault where Lincoln's remains were placed was only temporary. As I just stated a few minutes ago, an association was quickly formed to create a permanent memorial. They chose the spot in the heart of the city that was known as Mather Block, as I was talking about a few minutes ago. And as we know, Mary Todd Lincoln, Mrs. Lincoln, knocked that idea down. So, what we had now was a towering structure was built of Quincy gray granite, marble, and bronze. 
It featured an 85-foot-tall obelisk perched on top of a terrace, and each corner was a 25-foot circular pedestal. Its footprint was 119 by 72 feet, and within its base was memorial room and catacomb. And on December 21st of 1865, Lincoln was moved to a family receiving vault when the temporary one was needed for another deceased. This second location was somewhere in between the public receiving vault and the location of the final monument. Lincoln remained in this location for six years. On September 19th of 1871, with the memorial nearing its completion, Abraham Lincoln was moved to a crypt inside the tomb. And three years later, on October 15th of 1874, the coffin was moved once again to the catacomb in a marble sarcophagus placed on a platform in an airtight lead case. The body was now in its fourth and presumed final location. The tale of Lincoln's traveling remains should have ended. Roughly 18 months after the burial of President Lincoln in the Oak Ridge Cemetery in Springfield, Illinois, a criminal named Terrence Mullins concocted a scheme to kidnap the president's body and ransom it for $200,000. After enlisting the help of Jack Hughes and Louis Swiggles, Swiggles, the trio hid in the cemetery the night of November 7th of 1866, and they awaited their chance. Unfortunately, though, for them, just about everything that could go wrong did. First, none of the three could pick the lock on the iron gate separating them from Lincoln's marble sarcophagus. So Mullins attempted to saw through the padlock using a hacksaw. In his haste, he broke the blade, and therefore he had to use a file, which took much, much longer. Secondly, after gaining entrance, the men struggled to remove the heavy lid of Lincoln's sarcophagus, further delaying them. And finally, after exposing the ornate black and silver coffin housing the president's remains, the third and most significant flaw in their body snatching attempt surfaced. Gang member Swiggles, Swiggles was actually an undercover agent of the U.S. Secret Service assigned to keep an eye on Hughes. Moreover, more agents were also on site in Oak Ridge Cemetery that night in the anticipation of the kidnapping attempt. Despite this, Mullins and Hughes somehow still managed to escape, were eventually arrested and sent to jail for their body snatching attempt. There's also another account, which is basically the same thing, that in early of 1876, Chicago crime, crime boss James Big Jim Kennelly planned to steal Lincoln's body in exchange for a ransom and the release of an associate of his who was serving time at the state penitentiary. They broke into the marble sarcophagus by filing. They were not unable to move the heavy cedar, cedar coffin, undercover agent secret service, all that stuff. The almost thieves, however, were not apprehended, like I said, until the following night um, because a Pinkerton agent accidentally discharged his weapon, warning the criminals of their arrival. Um, so interestingly enough, yeah, the body, there was definitely uh, attempts to steal the body yeah, yeah and wow. hold it. Well, they were going to hold it. They wanted to steal it and then use it as ransom. That means basically steal it and ask for something in return of the body. Well, like not a good idea. Yeah, they went to jail. Oh, yeah. Yes. Concerned about future thefts, tomb custodian John Carroll Power had the coffin moved to the basement of the memorial, and they covered it with bits of lumber to make it look like a wood pile. On July 15th of 1882, Mary Todd Lincoln, Mrs. Lincoln, passed away after a tormented life. Robert Lincoln, her son, was concerned her body would also be the target for grave robbers. And a group that was dubbed the Lincoln Guard of Honor buried Mrs. Lincoln next to her husband, and the two would stay side by side for another five years. In 1887, a six-foot deep vault was dug in the catacomb of the tomb, large enough for both Abraham Lincoln and his wife, Mary Todd Lincoln. In 1900, the tomb was rebuilt. Since it was built on poor soil originally, and upon visiting, Robert Todd Lincoln insisted his father be placed in a crypt. So Lincoln is now buried 10 feet deep in a steel cage under the floor of the tomb. 
So when you're at Lincoln's tomb, he's actually 10 feet underneath the ground there where you're seeing uh, that uh, sarcophagus and everything in a steel cage underneath the floor. Officials decided to open the casket in 1901 to ensure the body hadn't been stolen. And it is said that when it was open, Lincoln was almost completely preserved, having been nearly mummified from the multiple embalming processes during his funeral procession. The entire tomb was reconstructed in 1930 and 1931, during which time the marble sarcophagus was removed and placed outside for storage, where souvenir hunters destroyed it. It was replaced with the red granite marker in front of the location where Lincoln is interred. Lincoln's corpse was actually viewed five times after his burial. Because of the unsuccessful body snatching attempts described above, as well as repairs necessitated over time due to the decay of Lincoln's tomb in the Oak Ridge Cemetery, the president's surviving son, Robert Lincoln, decided in 1901 that a more permanent method of protecting his father's mortal remains was required, required to both thwart future kidnapping efforts and to better honor the president. Thus, workers constructed a new tomb for President Lincoln's remains that included enclosing his coffin, like I said, in the metal cage, it's known as a mort safe, buried 10 feet deep before pouring tons of concrete into the hole. It permanently sealed Abraham Lincoln's corpse. And because of the forever nature of this method and fears that Lincoln's body had in fact already been stolen, however, authorities did decide to open Lincoln's coffin and view the remains. So therefore, on September 26th of 1901, two men chiseled an oblong piece out of the top of the lead-lined coffin, exposing the remains. More than 20 people viewed Abraham Lincoln's remains, which despite his burial 36 years earlier, still wore a melancholy expression, but his black chin whiskers hadn't changed at all. The wart on Lincoln's cheek remained, and all 23 people agreed that the remains in the coffin were in fact those of President Abraham Lincoln. And while this was the last time anyone viewed Lincoln's corpse, the president's remains were probably viewed on four previous occasions after his death, not including the multiple touch-ups he received during his funeral procession described earlier in this uh, part, including the first viewing on December 21st of 1865, just seven months after Lincoln's burial. Of course, as I said earlier, Mary Todd Lincoln and three of her four sons are buried there with him in Springfield in the tomb. Robert Todd Lincoln's the only one that's not. He's in Arlington National Cemetery. So, in conclusion, you guys are going to see some pictures of the tomb. You're going to see some pictures of the Lincoln Memorial when Henry and I visited in Washington, D.C. So, in closing, I'm going to leave you with these final words. Before I tell you of my journey, the morning after Lincoln was entombed, the funeral train that carried him left Springfield, Illinois, to return to Washington, D.C. And on March 18th of 1911, a prairie fire near Minneapolis, Minnesota, destroyed the train car that had so famously carried Lincoln's body to its final resting place. Pretty unbelievable. An amazing funeral procession, train procession across the country for our 16th president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. My brief story. I went to Lincoln's tomb in Springfield, Illinois for the first time in my life last year in 2020 during the pandemic. Lincoln's tomb was closed for a while due to COVID. There was nobody, they weren't allowing anybody in. It finally reopened. It was time for me to go. I was unawares of the times that they were allowing people to come in and view Lincoln's tomb. I arrived the day that I got there at 3.45 p.m. local Springfield, Illinois time. The very final tour group that was being allowed to view Lincoln's tomb inside was at 4 p.m. that day. I just made it in time to sign up for the final tour group of the day. At 4.30 p.m., they would be closing Lincoln's tomb for the day. Well, me 
flying solo during all my travels, I was alone, and I was the only person out of about maybe 10 total people that was alone. The other people were groups of three, family, you know, group of two, group of four. I was the only solo person. So, the tour guide talked to us outside, spread apart, socially distanced, told us a little history about the tomb. And groups of families, they were allowing them in groups at a time, like th groups of three or four at a time. That was it. You know, they weren't allowing everybody in the tomb at once, of course, due to social distancing. So I w waited outside. I walked around. I took a look at the temporary vault, pictures you're seeing on your screen now and all. Took a, a look at the surrounding location. Finally, I made my way back up to the entrance of the tomb. The tour guide was standing outside the doorway. He said, these are the last people coming out as a family exited the tomb. He looked at me, kind of with a half smirk on his face, and said, It's all yours. Well, I walked into the original room of the tomb, where there's a little statue that is a replica of the Lincoln Memorial. I made a right. I saw a couple other statues. And almost in a dream sequence, as you can see from the picture here, I made my way down a long marble hallway and finally it opened up to what you're seeing on your screen as the memorial resting place of Abraham Lincoln and I was all by myself. I could literally hear a pin drop. The hairs on my arms were standing up. Because I thought as I walked down this marble hallway and could hear my sneakers clanking against the marble floor, I could literally feel the mag magnitude and the history and just the pure awesomeness of what I was about to witness. And to have it to myself all alone was a treat that I'm sure not many people get inside of Lincoln's tomb. I'm sure nobody, there's usually nobody, nobody, probably nobody, not many. Nobody. And it was an amazing experience. It's something I will never forget. And uh, I hope you're enjoying these pictures of the Lincoln tomb as I'm speaking and talking about this. Uh, because it truly was an amazing, unique experience. So there you have it. And I know Henry wants to go one day when uh, COVID's all over. He wants to go see Lincoln's tomb, right? Yeah. And I want to go see Ford Theater. And he wants to go see Ford's and Theater, yep. I want to go see the... Um, Peterson House across yes, the street, yep. Yeah. He wants to see it all, Henry. But there you go. There you have it, guys. This ends our four-part series of Abraham Lincoln, the 16th President of the United States. I really hope that you enjoyed our four-part series, taking a look at the birthplace, the childhood, the presidency, the assassination, and then today, finally concluding with the funeral and the burial site, the tomb of Abraham Lincoln. We really do thank you guys, right? We really do. This was a lot of fun for us. A lot of fun. Four-part series of Lincoln. I know the videos were long, but I hope you've enjoyed them. I hope some of it was maybe some fun facts you didn't know uh, or just got refreshed on. Uh, and I hope it was as factually accurate as I possibly could be. Please leave those comments and questions below. Want to hear your opinions on everything? Yep. Tell me what you think. Yep. Thank you so much for our subscribers, yeah, right? Of, yeah. Of course, I, right? I just want 2,000. Yeah, oh yeah, almost 2,000. We thank you so much. And thank you for joining us for this four-part series, taking a look at our 16th president of the United States, Abraham, Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln. And we will see you next week for our next presidential series installment, taking a look at the 17th president, Andrew Johnson. We thank you. Stay safe out there. Yep, and we will see you next week. Yep. Right? Yep, we'll Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. in
a lullaby Someday I'll wish upon a star And wake up where the clouds are far behind me Where troubles melt like lemon drops Away above the chimney tops That's where Can't I pray? 